Sange churam sogi chunam bhai janju padu dani kapsu chia dagi chunyan ki pe sonam kia drola penji sange drupa show Sange churam sogi chunam bhai janju padu dani kapsu chia dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki drola penji sange drupa show Sange churam so ge chunam la janchu bhadu dhani kapsu chi dagi chan yangi pe sonam ki rola penche sange drupa Okay, so this session I'm going to go through the mantra and a little bit of the iconography. And um, also if there's parts of the sadhana that you wanted to ask about, we can um, popcorn some of those through as well. So if you have um, things that you were wanting to ask about that are fresh before we do the mantra, before we do the iconography, is there anything kind of right on the tip of your brain that you wanted to ask about? Yeah, David, go ahead. Yeah, so um, you had mentioned like when we visualize the guru above us um, that the Arya Tara is at his heart what is Arya? Like, I know that Arya is like a enlightened being. Are we talking the same thing? And why is it Arya Tara instead of just Tara? Yeah, you'll find a lot of epithets for Tara. Arya Tara, Jetsun Tara. <clears throat> um, Arya means someone who has realized the path of seeing, someone who has realized emptiness directly and perceptually. So not necessarily enlightened, but they have achieved that realization, that third path of the five paths. So of course she is a Buddha, she's fully enlightened, but the reason why we kind of highlight the Arya ability or the Arya development is that um, being in female form, she emphasizes wisdom. So the wisdom realizing emptiness is how you achieve the path of seeing, etc. like this. So she's an Arya. She's an so, Aria plus, but yes. <laughs> yeah. So eventually we seem in the visualization, we seem to just leave behind the guru and the mm -hmm. focus then becomes the Tara, but is it still the Tara within the guru or it, does it kind of just replace the guru at some point? Yeah, I've, I've heard both ways. It's kind of like there's the guru and then the Tara and then the Tam and the mantra garland. And then you just focus there, light going out. Some people keep all of the elaboration, some people simplify and just kind of keep awareness of what came before. And that's more common. So it's like, first you really visualize the guru and then at the heart of the guru is Tara and you let go of the visualization of the guru. And then you zero in on the mantra garland at Tara's heart. And you know, Tara is still there but you kind of release the visualization of Tara and you just focus in on the mantra and the light going out. Okay, and yeah. um, so, the colors that come from like her forehead, throat and heart, is that common with other Taras or is that specific to the green Tara? Yeah, that's common for all Taras. It's also common pretty much for all deities. Um, there's slight variation and sometimes you'll see more than three colors, but pretty much 99% of the time, white Om, red Ah, blue Hum, all deities all the time, enlightened body, enlightened speech, enlightened mind. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit about the six syllable tum that it doesn't appear within the mantra and nor within the praises. So I wondered how best are we to understand its meaning and its function within the context of the practice? Yeah, tum is her seed syllable. Okay, so a seed syllable of the deity is going to be basically, and all deities have a seed syllable, is basically the representation of everything about Tara, as opposed to the individual qualities and individual aspects of Tara, which is represented by the rest of the mantra. So the rest of the mantra will say, kind of highlight this, highlight that, she does this, she does that. Tom embodies all of it. So when we go through the mantra, weave in everything of the other parts of the mantra into that seed syllable. The seed syllable is also called the concentration being. And the concentration being can be what you focus in zeroing in on when you're particularly emphasizing your concentration practice, trying to develop calm abiding. So you just simplify your visualization just to the seed syllable. So that can be your simplified meditation. So Tom, you know, is gonna be about relieving from all fear. Fear mainly comes from karma and disturbing emotions. 
Tum is going to be about conquering all obstacles and all hindrances, but obstacles and hindrances come from karma and disturbing emotions. So that's kind of the, the summary of Tum. Does that help? Did you have a follow-up? No, that's helpful. I just wondered because, you know, it, like in Manjushri's mantra, the D is there at the end of the mantra. And I wondered whether it serves a function within that as well. And, you know, where the differentiation is, but that explanation is helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And, and some deities will have their seed syllable woven in and some won't. There's a lot of variation. Hi, everybody. Hi, uh, Venera. Uh, I have a question when um, concerning when the, the light goes out and in. It for me it became so powerful that I forgot like I was the light and I was just boom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I wanted to know is is it like you have to I have to concentrate more on the deity or uh, it, it doesn't matter because uh, when it like the green light go out and go in I, I was just in the green light like one with the light yeah I mean it, th that's fine and that's lovely and it sounds like you were having some imprints awaken a little bit whenever you have kind of um experiential bit bit of a magic flavor to your meditation you always want to ask yourself is it happening to me or from me in the sense of, is it happening within my control or without my control? Is it just kind of a spontaneous ripening of old seeds, which is kind of entertaining and interesting and points to some old practice from the path? Then that's interesting information. That's good information. Oh, I must have practiced this before, but don't think it means anything unless you bring your own control to it. Yeah, I, I wanted to know if I have to emphasize or focus on something to you know kind of control it but if it's happened it's happened I didn't yeah I so I, so you don't want to just let your mind do whatever it wants okay oh, okay so it sounds like you're having a combination of intention and old stuff old ripenings from the past and maybe even some energetic stuff happening the mantra itself is surprisingly powerful even if you haven't practiced very much it's a very mm -hmm. powerful mantra because it came from the enlightened mind of tara tara is particularly about swift action and protection so sometimes you'll you kind of be surprised you know it wasn't even your best work that day and you're having all these interesting experiences so that's interesting, but don't get lost in it. Yeah, no. Focus okay. on the mantra. Yeah, focus on the mantra. Kind of stay really in alignment with bodhicitta. The most okay. dangerous thing that can happen with Tantra is that you become so entertained by your experiences that you forget the point is to work for the enlightenment of all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then it, you know, and if you kind of like get attached to experiences like this happening, then you also you're disappointed on days when it doesn't. Yeah. And you think that's a bad practice day and it's not a bad practice day. It's just different mm -hmm. stuff's gonna ripen at different times. Okay, I understand, thank you. Yeah, yeah, but it sounds like it's, you know, things are connecting and that's really good. But one thing that kept happening to me and I wanted to ask you about it was um, whenever I, I, I focused just on the green light um, and then I tried to switch up the focus to like a lighter shade of green just to see if I could maybe make a transition like that. I could not. I got really like, it was like a wave of frustration I had to ride out just because for me sitting still and sitting in one spot is really hard. So I know this is something I have to practice. Um, should I just stick with that, just the green light for now? And then when I'm able to do that without feeling so many waves of like frustration, then add that next color. Does that sound like a good progression for me? Um, be okay. gentle, be kind of organic about it. And it is that thing of start very simply. And then when you feel comfortable with that level of stability, bring in more detail. And then you okay. hold a little bit more detail and it feels comfortable, you bring in more. It's a little bit like when you learned how to drive a car, it was very yeah. overwhelming to remember to look in all of the mirrors and to watch the pedals and do the steering wheel and all the knobs. But then over time it became second nature. 
<laughs> but now that it's second nature, you still have to do those things and there's still many things going on, but it's a lot more in the flow. Yeah, so kind That's of right awesome. now you're learning all the bits and pieces and you might have to spend some time with, okay, the mirror is here. I have to look in it. <laughs> this yeah. mirror is here. I have to look in it. But eventually it's just going to be second nature that you weave it all into what you're doing. Okay, cool. Can I ask one more like really basic follow-up question? Sure, sure. Or do you want to? Okay, very basic. Why is concentration important to enlightenment? Well, what happens in the absence of concentration? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an even better question. Yeah. Con Concentration's important, simply speaking, for power and mm -hmm. for depth. So okay. it's a little bit like right now, we can be a good, kind person doing the best we can in this world. And then we get distracted and we say the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing, we fall off track. And think about how much more powerful your life would be if you were just focused stably on what you could already do and what you already valued, not even adding yeah. anything more, <laughs> you know, just what you already believe stably, you would have such a more powerful, effective life. Uh, for me, it always helps to think, you know, of all of the worst mistakes of my life, how many would I have made if I had been focused on my path that day? And how many were just, I was distracted. Yeah. There are a few mistakes in our life that we meant it, <laughs> right? We meant to say a mean thing and we meant to hurt someone's feelings or we meant to do something dodgy. But most of the time, we were just vague and just slipped and just made a mistake. So concentration would change so much in our life. Okay. So it's one of these things that it's going to be necessary for enlightenment, but it's not like you have to wait till enlightenment for it to be useful. Sure. Yeah, and uh, more meditation, less potential for Alzheimer's. So they say. <laughs> I like that. Thank you again. You're welcome. All right, so we're going to do a little, um, we're going to look at iconography and we're going to look at the mantra. Some of this you guys are really familiar with, you older students. Um, if there's bits that you've heard from other lamas that you wanted to share, um, you're very welcome to. This particular explanation I'm grabbing from Andy Weber, who is a, a really renowned Tonka painter. And this book, Chittamani Tara and the 21 Taras, this is a how to draw Tara, but it actually has a lot of really good stuff about the iconography and the symbolism. So I really recommend this book. Okay, so why is she green? <laughs> green represents the wind element and indicates the speed through which Tara responds. Also indicating this is her leg out, ready to leap to the aid of sentient things. So she's green and this can be confusing if you've studied a little bit, you might think that she's related to the Buddha family of Amoga City. Amoga City um, is the head of the Karma family. And this family is represented also by, by wind, but she is not of the Amoga City Buddha family per se. She's of the Amitabha Buddha family, the red guy up there in her crown. There's kind of a dual thing happening with Tara. One is the Buddha family that she belongs to. All Buddhas belong to a Buddha family, meaning what they emphasize in the practice. So Tara belongs to the Lotus family. The head of the Lotus family is Amitabha. The color it emphasizes is red. You don't see she's not red at all. She doesn't need to be red. This is about the Buddha family. And most importantly, what it's dealing with is attachment energy. Okay, so you might have heard that Tantra is all about transformation. And this doesn't mean that you take an affliction and turn it into wisdom. You can't change two things that are fundamentally different into each other. But the mind can have both, not at the same time, but the mind sometimes has desirous attachment. The mind sometimes has the wisdom of discriminating awareness or something akin to it. It can do both of these. What we're talking about in Tantra is the energy of it. Okay, and the energy is just neutral. Energy you can turn to positive and beneficial or distort into negative and destructive. So the energy that is emphasized by the Amitabha Lotus Buddha family is kind of the way you would think of fire. Okay, so fire can do what? It can be warm, it can illuminate. That's its positive side. Shines a light on things, brings warmth and comfort and security and brightness. 
The bad side is that it destroys and it eats and it consumes and it's never enough. So you see the way in which fire represents this energy that can either be warm and bright or all consuming and never satisfied. And that's what attachment is, isn't it? It's all consuming, it's never satisfied. It gets what it wants and it wants more. It exaggerates what it needs for happiness and it's grumpy about it. All sorts of stuff happens with attachment, which is very fire-like. When you take that energy, that fire-like energy, and you bring enlightened activity or enlightened awareness to it, something that is wisdom-based, you're educating your discrimination and you're bringing out the best of that fire quality, the warmth and the brightness. So when you do Tara practice, even though it doesn't explicitly say so, that's the energy that's emphasized, is taking that attachment-like energy and taking the, the energetic quality of it, taking away the attachment and adding discriminating awareness. Does it sort of make sense? Yeah, so that's the Buddha family that she belongs to. And there are five Buddha families and we're not gonna do that whole spiel, but um, you know, if there's a chart I could send you if you're really curious, <laughs> okay. But um, so the Amitabha Buddha family is who she belongs to, but then she has the color of Amoga City. She has the color related to wind energy. And so there's an association there, which is that swiftness or all encompassing action, movement. Okay, so it's odd to think of wind as um, the color of wind being green. We're not saying the color of wind is green. We're saying wind is represented by the color green. So when you see green in Tibetan iconography, that's what it's representing. Okay, so she's got that wind-like ability. Yeah. Those are probably the two most classically known things about the Tara iconography, is that she's swift and her leg out is ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. And honestly, those are the two most important ones to think about. It's also kind of interesting to think of this archetypal feminine quality that is much more engaged in the everyday worldly things of life and is right in there benefiting. Kind of those archetypal qualities of the mother who has got that kind of warmth and that care. So she's not gonna just sit still in her meditation. She's going to move with her meditation. That's, that's why I love her because she is just like engaged. You know what I mean? She's not just this passive person. And I always, my uh, sort of guru that I learned from explained that it, just like you did, that it's very swift. And every time I've chanted the tear, even though I'm, I don't necessarily think I'm very good at it, I get an answer very quickly. Um, yeah. it, that's usually what happens. And I, I can sort of tell that, okay, this is definitely something. I, but am I supposed to use this more within my practice? And that like, let's say I'm having a frustrating time with a student and let me just pull up my, my, my malas and go through some, is that sort of the, okay, makes sense. You can do it both, right? So what you do on your cushion should inform what you do off your cushion. So your off the cushion work is gonna be a lot more simple and simplified and direct and uh, you know not so many details. It's just the mantra, maybe light, that's it. And no one has to know, it's completely secret. You can be doing it in your head, not even just through your breath. But if you're doing the seated practice with the sadhana sometimes, it's gonna build strength into that quiet little everyday practice that you do just walking around. Mantra, you know, by its nature is that which protects the mind. It protects the mind from its negative habits, from karma and disturbing emotions. And so anytime you feel like reciting a mantra, it's really just do it. You know, you don't have to make a whole song and dance. You don't have to sit down formally. It's gonna benefit the mind anytime for sure. It's just that when you do these more formal seated sessions, it gives power to the walking around everyday life sessions. 
Look, the, the thing that is important to emphasize is that these mantras have power because of the deities that created them. They have an influence on your inner energy system that will have an influence on your daily life. But don't feel like mantras are good from their own side. Nothing is inherently existent, not even Buddhas, not even mantras. So it's not like a magic spell that's going to magically make you better. It's still a dependent arising. Yeah, it's still a dependent arising. So don't disempower yourself by thinking you have no role in the connections made by this mantra or that your mind is somehow a passive participant in this magical pixie dust that's gonna somehow make you better. You have to be an active participant in engaging with this energy. You know, it's a little bit like um, that feeling of if you have a good delicious meal that's gonna make you very healthy, but you gobble it up without thinking, it kind of goes straight through you. <laughs> but if you eat it with a lot of intention, you almost feel it nourishing your cells as it goes in. I don't know if that's a good example or not, but it's like, it's good food, but it's only gonna go in if you're receptive. And what is good food for you might not be good food for someone else. So it might be that Tara has this amazing effect on John because he has a karmic disposition and an affinity with her energy. But for someone else, Manjushri is gonna be a lot more powerful. And it doesn't mean one is better than the other. It means that one of us has, a, we have an affinity for one over than the other, you know, or that maybe we are in alignment with the Buddha family of one more than the other. So it's just, uh, keep coming back to self-knowledge. Yeah. Um. Green Tara, I have this strange history, I guess, with, with her. Um, ever since I first started practicing Buddhism in about 1989, and I was going to take a, a, um, an initiation, I don't think I was quite ready for it. And then my dad got really sick, and I ended up having to go take care of him. Every time that an initiation comes up, someone gets sick, and I have to go take care of them, and I think that's interesting. Also, that I associate her with my big sister who actually died on this day three years ago. And so I thought, oh, how auspicious, you know, but what's interesting to me, aside from all that magical thinking or something is um, <laughs> that what you said about the Amitabha attachment energy and the fact that she is a mother and, and that the mother energy is the positive expression of that. And I'm going through something right now with my actual child and working with her troubles in relation to not overemphasizing my attachment. And I know that my attachment as a mother to protecting her is both a source of potential help, but also, I guess, like with anybody harm. And so I'm wondering for you, because you're so articulate, could say something, even though you don't really relate to being a mom, <laughs> to, to how mothers maybe who are really interested in Tara but who also are trying to practice wisely with attachment and allowing their, especially teenage daughters subject to so many terrible influences of, you know, body shame and all sorts of things. I, I'm not going to go into details, but I think that there are ways in which we have, we as moms have to let our daughters become their own selves, but at the same time, protect them from all these just terrible, terrible, terrible things out there. Like I, I'm not going to go into details, but we know yeah. We know about sexual discrimination and violence against women. We know all that, you know? And I think that I'm trying to practice without going into great detail with attachment energy, because I think we're all, we all have to allow each other to have our own karma. I think yeah. that's enough. I don't know what, what else to say. If any of that resonated with you, that would be. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't remember the last life I was a mother, but I certainly remember being a daughter, <laughs> you know? and. Uh what was effective from my own mother and what was not effective from my own mother. So all of us were children at some point, right? And to think, when, when did we feel held by our parents' care and affection? And when did we feel suffocated and oppressed or controlled by what was attachment, but they thought was love? You know, like from an experiential perspective, what was our responsiveness like in both cases and kind of what were the ingredients of those in both cases? Because, you know, I remember, as we all do, certain highlights from our childhood where things our parents said finally stuck and things that our parents said that we thought was rubbish, right? <laughs> and um, I remember my folks saying to me once, 
you know, you're a teenager, you're going to want to party, you're going to want to get drunk, you're going to want to be silly. And we, of course, want to tell you the consequences of these, but you're your own person, you're going to get into trouble. So what we say to you is, please call us, don't drive drunk. And we won't, you won't be in trouble, we won't ground you, we won't do anything, but we just, we hope you won't drink, but if you do, just call us. We don't want you to drive drunk. And I remember them saying that, and it was such a, um, it was such an act of respect and such an act of care that it was kind of like they were giving me my responsibility for my own life, while at the same time knowing I would make mistakes, but kind of not wanting those mistakes to lead to death, <laughs> right? You know, there was something in, in their conveyance of advice tied with respect that brought out my own wisdom. And I think that when you're a good friend, the same thing is true. It's like, you can't tell people anything, but you can invite wisdom from them and collaborate. And as a mother, I cannot imagine the fear you would experience in needing to let go sometimes. I mean, the chaos and the tragedy that can happen in the world. I can't even imagine that like pro level of letting go. That's like <laughs> supersonic pro level letting go to be able to be all in while at the same time saying, I can't control everything. But if you can think, what is her Tara? Where is her Tara? Not just you as Tara, but how can you speak to her Tara and invite it out? So she can protect herself. So she can wear the armor of Tara and be safe in this world. You know, as much as you yourself trying to stay grounded and managing your own attachment expectation, all that, that's hugely important. But I think what we offer to each other is that deep respect that knows we all have Buddha nature, rather than that thing that we can do where we're so worried about the worst case scenario and all of the afflictions and mistakes and ignorance of the people in front of us that we almost invite that. <laughs> yeah, invite their wisdom instead. This one thought, this one thought. So, you know, I think all you can do is treat people with respect and give them all the information and they make their own choices. And you can even you know, be radical about here are all the consequences that are unrelated to me. I'm not going to punish you. Life is going to punish you by this and that behavior. If and when that happens, I am here. I will never get up, give up on you no matter how messy life gets. You know, I mean, remember generations past, maybe your parents' generation, where if someone got uh, pregnant out of wedlock, it was like a disaster. Do you remember, right? Like it was a, now it's like, oh, that's inconvenient. All right, let's figure it out. But it's not like a shameful thing. It's just a logistical issue. Yeah, for the most part, of course, there's parts in the world where it's very shameful still. But you know, what we're trying to get to at this point is for the world and society to be able to make mistakes and show mistakes without family and society writing them off or losing hope for them. We have to make it safe for people to fall on their face. We can't really prevent them from falling on their face. I, I often think about this with, um, with the Me Too movement, which I thought was very important, but now I feel needs to evolve into how can we have an open conversation about how pervasively people all make mistakes and how to actually take responsibility and accountability and not be discarded from society for making terrible choices. You know, like how amazing would it have been if in the 90s, Bill Clinton had just said, yes, I slept with Monica Lewinsky. It was a bad choice. It was an abuse of power. I regret it. I apologize to her. I apologize to my wife. I apologize to my country. Yes, I did it, moving on. I mean, what a different world it would be if you just owned it and we could deal with it and just move the heck on. You know, so, so these are the layers of thinking we wanna, we wanna come to where we can see that people are not their mistakes, that people have a Tara potential within them and then all this mess over the top. And so then you can cope with the mess much more easily if you're holding focus on the Tara potentiality of both them and you. I don't know, somehow it helps 
you know, when we start to feel oppressed by the suffering of the world and the pain of the world, if we're holding the tariness of the world at the same time, you know, as like parallel truths, then you're not negating your own responsibility and trying to, I don't know, combat climate change or whatever. You're not putting that aside and saying, oh, that's just the world. We're working on enlightenment. Who cares about the environment? You're not going too far. You're taking responsibility. You're doing what you can, but you're also not getting lost in despair because you know that's not the whole story of existence. So practice seeing others as Tara as much as seeing yourself. Thank you, Roxy. That was really informative. Thank you. And thank you, Venerable. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, some time ago, it may not be appropriate right now, but some time ago, I had a, um, a challenging thing in my life. And while I was lying, waiting, the first thing that came into my head was the name of Tara. And I believe that Tara was there with me at that moment. So save my life. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that. Yep. It was a really important and, and moment. Yeah. And I, I no, called it out. With, with I yelled it. Yeah. 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 Hey. yeah. Help yeah. a girl out. People said, yeah. who's, who's she? Where is she? <laughs> Anyway, so that was no, just mm. no thank you yep. for that Eleanor and it's mm. it's just this thing where we have to keep remembering that we are surrounded by enlightened beings all the time but we don't feel them you know we don't no. feel their presence we don't feel their support we don't feel their love that does not mean we're not being flooded with their love and their care and their support but what you did Eleanor is you just you offered a like a bridge or a gateway from them to you by simply calling her name. So it's not like you pulled them from anywhere. It's not like you pulled her from anywhere. You opened up to the one that was already there right in front of you the whole time. And, but it does require something from our side. You know, the Buddhas want nothing but our happiness. Think of who, how you will be when you're a Buddha. Right? When you're a Buddha, what are you going to want for sentient beings? Are you going to want them to suffer? No, of course not. You don't want them to suffer now. And you're just a regular schmo. Of course, they don't want you to suffer. Mm. You know, but think of, you know, a friend in distress who you love so much, and you're just flooding them with affection. They don't feel it unless they're open to it. Doesn't mean mm. you don't have it. You might have all of the things that they need in order to get their life together, all the logistical support, all the intellectual support, all the skillful means. You might have everything your friend needs, but unless they ask, your hands are tied. And the mm, same is true, true of the enlightened beings, right? They have everything we need, mm. but their hands are tied by our karma, not their abilities. So these practices mm. are in a way helping to like untie the tangle that blocks us from seeing each other. The Buddhas and the ordinary beings. It's clearing the cobwebs, whatever imagery you want to think of. And, and it is sometimes as simple as just asking for help. Yeah, so do, so ask and ask and let go, ask and let go. Yeah, so my question is, and, and I guess this could be for anybody, do women ever feel exhausted with men? Because I sort of feel like men and are an obstacle. You guys are so articulate about the way you explain how to do this. It is beautiful and it's refreshing as a man to be around women and hear you guys express yourself so confidently. And I love it. So how do we, <laughs> I, I don't, how do we, how do men become less of an obstacle for women? Is that a good question? I, I feel like Tara is sort of an answer to that in a way. Well, yeah, I think you answer your own question. I mean, I think that, that women need to not fear the masculine sides of themselves and need to integrate the masculine sides of themselves. And men need to see the feminine sides of themselves and integrate the feminine sides of themselves. A balanced person has masculine and feminine integrated within themselves, no matter what their physiology is or whatever their identity is. It's about the integration and kind of, I guess it's like, it's like a union or a marriage or some sort of balance within yourself. And each gender has something to learn from the other. But a, okay. lot of, 
a lot of the challenges you're talking about are just socialization. They have nothing to do with sex or gender, it's socialization. Damn the patriarchy, it hurts everyone, including the fellows, right? Um, maybe especially the fellows, right? Yeah. They always talk about how being a man is better in terms of physical safety and in terms of access to resources and strength and things, and then how it's better to be a woman because you're conditioned and socialized for compassion to be normal. <laughs> you're not gonna be shamed for being compassionate. You know, and, and our bodies are built with so much pain right in them that it's very easy for us to understand what pain is like, you know. So, I mean, there's there's pros and cons to any kind of body, tall bodies, short bodies, fat bodies, thin bodies, male bodies, female bodies, intersex bodies, all the bodies. There's pros and cons to each. I think what's a deeper question is how do we train in listening to wisdom from anyone? How do we train in hearing Tara everywhere? It's never really the maleness that is the annoying thing. It's usually the socialization. Yeah. Do you guys agree, right? Like we can call it, oh, that's such a female thing. That's such a male thing. But really it's upbringing and conditioning and what we've taught is necessary and how much space we've been allowed to take up. You know, I, when I lived in Australia, I suddenly became aware of my Americanness. <laughs> You know, and realizing how much more space I take up and how much more loud I am just because I was socialized American, you know, never mind male or female, just being American. And then I thought, oh, that must be how it is for guys. They don't even realize how much space they've been trained to take up because it's just how they were taught. Just like me being an American in a foreign country. It's like, oh, now I'm the guy because <laughs> here I am just loud and big and, you know, expecting to be listened to. And the Australians are like, Yikes, shh, tall poppy, <laughs> right? Helen knows what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? Pros and cons, pros and cons, context. Okay, more iconography, here we go. So we got green, we got leg out, and now we got right hand, left hand, okay? So her right hand is in the gesture or the mudra of fearlessness and granting refuge. And her left hand shows the gesture or mudra of bestowing blessings and guidance. So what she's saying is her vibe or her trend or her emphasis is about freeing sentient beings from anxiety of all types and bringing soothing and healing and support of all types. So that's kind of what she's emphasizing by her swift action. And then she's holding the stem of an Utpali flower between her thumb and ring finger. And this shows um, the flower part, shows the knowledge of the three times, past, present, and future. Normally this flower has an open bloom, a complete bud, and one is, that is just starting to open, but it depends on the artist. So um, the bud is uh, the future, and the one starting to open is the present, and the full bloom is the past. Um, her three fingers here, um, the ones that aren't holding the stem, the other three, these represent the three jewels of refuge, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And this is also the gesture of supreme enlightenment. And uh, the union of method and wisdom are also symbolized by these two fingers that are holding the stem. The fact that they're touching shows the union of method and wisdom. So that's kind of cool. And then the jewels, she's got jewels all over the place. They represent the six perfections. And so um, most noteworthy, I think, like is the necklace. She has three necklaces and these represent the three types of generosity. So um, there's four or three types depending on how you categorize them, but the generosity of material aid, the generosity of offering freedom from fear, the generosity of loving kindness and teaching the Dharma, so these three necklaces represent those three types. And then um, the rest of the six perfections are depicted elsewhere. For example, like her bracelets and her anklets represent ethics. Yeah, so <clears throat> when you look at Tara, all of this jewels, all of these flowy fabrics, all of this flower crown, none of that is just accidental. That's all symbolizing parts of the path. Yep, so when we say blessings, we mean moving your mind towards virtue when the mind is inspired to progress. 
So to say bestowing blessings can sometimes be a little problematic because again, it sounds like magic pixie dust. Really what bestowing blessings means is that your mind has had enough habituation towards virtue mm -hmm. and enough aspirational prayers and requests that you shift from an intellectual understanding to a heart understanding. I see. Yep. So your requesting blessings really means, may my knowledge take root, may it take heart. Okay, so then we'll do the mantra. And there's a few different ways to depict the mantra. Um, here's the seed syllable, large in the center, and then om tare, om tare, this way, tare, tu tare, tu re, so ha. You can you can visualize it in English in English characters or any characters that you prefer, as long as it represents these sounds. So the sounds are more important than the letters that depict them. Um, here is what's called a mantra garland, and here's the visualization that would be at Tara's heart during the mantra recitation time. So imagine that they're standing upright and green. And then here's the Tara mandala with the mantra garland at the center. All deities have a mandala, whether it's depicted or not. And basically what you've got is connection with the five Buddha families, as well as the central one being the five, the family that they're most affiliated with, different layers of protection and symbolism. And I won't go into the mandala because this is a mixed group, but that's just kind of a general knowledge one. Um, this idea, I'm starting to get a little more detailed, which is exciting. The seed syllable in the middle standing up, and then the other syllables around standing up means yep. they're so three-dimensional. It's like yep. going around, because I used to think it was this way, right? But no, it's actually going around. Yeah. That's what you mean by standing up. Yes, yes, standing up. So it's, it's hard to depict, you know, there's animations you can find on YouTube, but um, both the mandala and the mantra garland look like a circle in front of you, but are actually this way and three dimensional. So the mandala is like the blueprint of a house and the surrounding landscaping. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, you see four doors and roofs and scaffolding and you know colonnades and all of this it's like a blueprint for a 3d design and the mantra garland is um, a flat depiction of something that stands upright and is 3d so when you visualize it visualize it three-dimensional when you visualize Thank tara you. visualize her three-dimensionally as well like you shouldn't think of her as like a flat painting think of her real and transparent light and able to move and smiling like a real person and very real is the main thing real thank you yeah so she's the manifestation of all the buddha's holy actions of body speech and mind and therefore she is called mother by depending on tara one receives enlightenment as all those who have in the past depended on the special deity this manifestation of all the buddha's holy actions have received enlightenment so she's the representative of holy action yeah action and protection um, so remember with all of these deities there are layers there's the historical story of someone who was like the first one of whatever deity you know, the first Tara, or the one who is known as Tara, yes. There's also the um, folk story version. There's also the archetypal energy. There's also what they represent. So there's layers and layers and layers of meaning. But it's like all enlightened beings have a Tara nest that they could manifest, even if that's not who they were when they were a human being. Yeah. So when we're enlightened, there will be the Buddha that was once Yunten, right? And she will be able to manifest as Tara or Medicine Buddha or Chen Rezig or whoever, depending on what is needed. But what my main Buddha is, is yet to be determined and may have a whole new name. Who can say, what will my pure land be? I don't know. I feel like there will be snacks. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> there will also be puppies and kittens, I don't know, born from lotuses, knowing me. <laughs> but... So there's going to be the individual quality and individual karma of each Buddha and who they have connection to, but there's also the universal abilities and capabilities and 
I guess, ability to manifest as whatever is needed for that disciple. Does it make sense? So right now it's like all these deities are tools in a tool belt of our practice. Sometimes you really need action, protection, support, and connecting with Tara is really going to help you get into an alignment with inviting that energy and sending that energy, both. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. Um, just a question off the back of what you were just saying. When we hear um, kind of stories of lineage lamas like Atisha and Lama Tsongkhapa, that they've received teachings directly from Tara, and this is how they have attained realizations. How would you describe that? Which, which kind of aspect of that would that fit into? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's, you know, th these stories are so interesting to me because who is it that's talking to them really? Who is it that's talking to them really? You know, like the story of a Sangha who prayed to Maitreya for 12 years and never saw him. And then he wound up, he was there. And there's the, you know, beautiful, you know, maggot licking dog story. We know that story and love it, right? Um, <laughs> the brief explanation. Um, was he talking to himself the whole time? The Maitreya he would become or the Maitreya that was latent and growing within him? Or was he talking to his root guru who was taking the aspect of Maitreya for him in that moment? Or was he talking to the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas who took the shape and form of Maitreya in order to subdue his mind? Or was he talking to the being who became Maitreya historically? And it's unclear who exactly it is, but what we know is that they have the shape and form of the deity that came from the enlightened mind. And the shape and form of that deity taught specifically and directly in alignment with the characteristics of that visual. So, you know, I remember Kadrala saying once at a teaching that um, when she was little, a beautiful white lady used to appear to her in her dreams and sing her songs about emptiness. <laughs> and later she realized it was white Tara. <laughs> and we're all like, cool, <laughs> you know, but, you know, she didn't know who it was at the time because she was just a little girl and, you know, a beautiful white lady with, with eyes in her palms and feet singing her songs about emptiness. That sounds like way better dreams than what I had. I don't know about you guys, but um, so it's like, what is from the side of the Dharmakaya? Because the Dharmakaya is formless, but then the Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya can take any number of aspects. So I think that the simplest way to understand it is if you're inviting, say, loving kindness, it will take the shape of Maitreya when communicating with you. If you're inviting and communicating with the energy of action and protection, it will take the shape of Tara to speak to you. But which minds specifically, or if there's multiple minds, that's all kind of, it, it's an open question an open question yeah go ahead uh, Paula what is uh could you define a root guru I mean many people know I, I mean I'm kind of fairly new so can you tell me what a root guru is a root guru is the one you take a highest yoga tantra empowerment from some would say any tantric empowerment from um so a tantric empowerment ceremony that's one of your root gurus when you're talking Personally and specifically, you might say that your heart teacher, the one who explains things most directly and most perfectly for your mind, is your root guru. So it depends on the context, what that word is going to mean. But generally speaking, it has a tantric connotation. I see. Thank you. Sure. So uh, mantra. Here we go. So OM always means enlightened body, speech, and mind. In this context, Tara's enlightened holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. Generally, the Tare to Tare Ture contains the essence of the Four Noble Truths. So understanding the truth of suffering, the truth of origin, the truth of cessation, and the truth of path. So there's Om. Om's the easiest one. And then Tare. Tare signifies release from samsara, this determination to be free. So the name is like the female one who releases. So her function is to release us and to help us release ourselves from suffering, fear, etc. cetera, um, like that. So that's another easy-ish one to understand. 
So tutare is the longer one. And this is related to freeing us specifically from the eight fears. So the eight fears are represented by fears that humans experience that are really about the inner things that cause pain. And we talked about this in some depth when I did the White Tara weekend. So if you're wanting a longer, longer conversation of the eight fears, look at the White Tara series. But in brief, Tutare signifies dispelling fears, the female one who cuts off or dispels the eight fears or dangers, stopping each inner fear, which is related to an outer fear. So ignorance is the danger of the elephant, hatred is the danger of fire, attachment is the danger of water, pride is the danger of the lion, jealousy is the danger of the snake, wrong view is the danger of the thief, doubt is the danger of the hungry ghost, and miserliness is the danger of chains. And there's a beautiful prayer written to Tara by the first Dalai Lama that goes into these in some depth. So I thought you might like to see that. So it says, dwelling in the mountains of wrong views of selfhood, puffed up, withholding itself superior, it claws other beings with contempt. The lion of pride, please protect us from this danger not tamed by the sharp hooks of mindfulness and vigilance, dulled by the maddening liquor of sensual pleasures. It enters wrong paths and shows its harmful tusks. The elephant of ignorance, please protect us from this danger. Driven by the wind of inappropriate attention, billowing forth swirling smoke clouds of misconduct, it has the power to burn down forests of goodness, the fire of anger, please protect us from this danger. Lurking in its dark pit of ignorance, unable to bear the wealth and excellence of others, it swiftly injects them with its cruel poison. The snake of jealousy, please protect us from this danger. Roaming the fearful wilds of inferior practice and the barren wastes of absolutism and nihilism, they sack the towns and hermitages of benefit and bliss. The thieves of wrong views, please protect us from this danger. Binding embodied beings in the unbearable prison of cyclic existence with no freedom, it locks them in cravings tight embrace. The chain of miserliness, please protect us from this danger. Sweeping us in the torrent of cyclic existence so hard to cross, we are conditioned by the propelling winds of karma. We are tossed in the waves of birth, aging, sickness, and death. The flood of attachment, please protect us from this danger. Roaming in the space of darkness, confusion, tormenting those who strive for ultimate aims, it is viciously lethal to liberation. The carnivorous demon of doubt, please protect us from this danger. So this tutare frees from the eight fears. And then ture signifies releasing from disease, not only the physical diseases that we ordinary beings recognize. So not only physical sufferings, she also benefits by releasing sentient beings from mental diseases, the 84,000 diseases of the disturbed and unsubdued mind and its karmic actions. This shows the true cessation of suffering by actualizing the true path, realizing nirvana, release from samsara, and the enlightenment within one's own mind. And then soha just means so be it, or may the ideas take root and integrate. Most mantras contain om, between om at the beginning and soha or whom at the mantra's end is the deity's meaning, which signifies the path. It contains the method and wisdom of the path. We actualize the method and wisdom by purifying our body, speech, and mind and becoming oneness with Tara. So that's the mantra in a nutshell. And you don't have to know what it means for it to be effective, but for your intellectual mind, it sometimes gives you more focus. So mantras are a case of a dependent arising where the power of the speech and the words themselves, because of who it came from, has an impact. But then you can also add to that impact with your own focus. Yeah, the more you focus, the more power it has. When you say the mantra, 
sometimes it's fine to have it just rolling in the back of your mind if you're around people and they will be annoyed or confused. But when you can, say it in such a way that air moves through your mouth, even just, you know, like under your breath, like a whisper, because the vibration of those tones has a positive impact on your inner energy system. So then learning about the meaning of the mantra is almost incidental. It's not as emphasized, even though so much of Buddhism, it's about learning the reasons why and how and where everything fits together. That is important. But in the case of mantra, you know that it protects your mind and that's enough. <laughs> but if you go into more and more layers about it, it makes you more intrigued and kind of more enthusiastic for it. So it's worthwhile understanding the different syllables kind of for your own enthusiasm and momentum. But if you forget different pieces, it's not like it stops the mantra from working or anything like that. Do you have any um, questions about the mantra or the symbolism before we call it a day? Yeah, Helen, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't find the raise button, raise hand button. Um, it, it might be a silly question, but um, I was just wondering with the um, iconography, the, the image itself, um, I couldn't help but notice Tara's palms and the soles of her feet are not green. And they seem to have mandalas or something on them. I was just wondering, I might be going into too much detail, but I was just wondering why the green doesn't extend to the palms and the soles of the feet. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, it depends on the artist. Um, the, this artist was Fred uh, Vanderzee, who's a student of Andy Weber, and he's put Dharma wheels on the palms and the soles oh, yeah. of the feet. So this idea that she's bestowing fearlessness by teaching the Dharma like this. So you'll find that in some depictions of her and some you'll just find straight green. Okay, great. But yeah, um, so I, yeah excellent. Um, so a little follow-up question. Um, when you were describing each of the hands, you, you said left and right hands, but when you said the left hand, it was on our left. So it's not her left hand. It, I, I just go, get confused with that because when... I do visualizations, it's like the left hand does this, I see it on my right. Yes, I know. I get Unless, of course, she's problem. facing the same way as me. Yeah, yes, sorry, I, I just got confused with that. <laughs> yeah. Is that just me? <laughs> no, no, I totally do that all the time. Yeah, so when you're, when you're looking at Tara um, face on, um, yeah. oh, let's see, what's the best way to put it? Um, okay, so the, how's this? Okay, so the, the hand that has, um, the stem in it, yes. yeah. yeah, the stem holding hand yeah. <laughs> um, between the thumb and ring finger, that's yeah. um, her left, our yes. right, yeah. Yeah, okay. Her left, yeah. our okay. right. Yeah. Okay, good, sorry. I just <laughs> I just got all, all mixed up <laughs> going through them, but that's okay. I'm glad it's not just me. It's all good. No, it's not just you. I always have to stop and think. <laughs> no worries. thank you yeah this was wonderful today thank you so much for doing this um quick question about do you have any specific information or insight into people with traumatic brain injuries one of the reasons why i follow you is because you put everything online on, on your youtube channel and i really appreciate that because i will forget a lot of this stuff and then i'm able to watch it but the one thing i've noticed at least in my life and i'm just curious if this is true for anybody else do you guys experience the same thing and that you'll learn something, you forget about it, and then it just sort of magically comes up, up again. And you're like, oh, okay. And I, I'm just curious if I can just relax at this point, or do I still need to be so, I don't know, um, anxious about forgetting stuff? Well, I mean, certainly don't be anxious. No, be anxious, John, yeah. be more anxious. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the brain is not the mind. So that's good news. The brain and the mind have a relationship however, and that's somewhat aggravating if you have a traumatic brain injury. But if you can think that the basics, loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, you know, you believe you're trying to reinforce, everything else is detail. Yeah, everything else is detail. And what happens with our study is that if we let it stay too simple, sometimes it can get superficial. If we make it too elaborate, we can get too stuck in our head. And so for all of us, brain injury or not, to have a really gentle and organic flexibility and movement that takes what is very simple and elaborates it into a lot of detail and depth, 
and then doesn't stay there, but then brings it back into the very simple form and then elaborates and then makes it simple and then elaborates and makes it simple. And what you know at the end of your path is not gonna be radically different words than what you know now. You know, you'll be a Buddha and think what's important in life, loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom, <laughs> you know? It's not new than what you know now, but the depth of it and the resonance with it is gonna be what's different. So the main thing you wanna be thinking about in your practice is repeat, 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 but with a happy mind. Because what you really want is a positive association with practice, not an anxious racing to get to the end. Yeah, so if you can habituate your mind to loving the investigation process and loving engagement with depth and meaning, then however slow or fast it goes doesn't really matter because you're on the right track. Does that make, yeah? So not too tight, not too loose. Again and again, that keeps coming up. Yeah. All right, well, we'll go ahead and dedicate and then uh, we'll have a half day tomorrow. May I quickly become Guru Aryatara and lead each and every sentient being into her enlightened state because of these merits. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Thanks, everyone.